Richard Linklater's Before Trilogy is a cornerstone in American cinema. It is hands down one of the greatest trilogies ever made. Let's break down each film, which star Ethan Hawke and Julie Delpy. Hello, movie friends. Welcome back to Raiders of the Lost Podcast, the ultimate film and TV podcast. And today, we're breaking down what we consider a perfect trilogy, the Before Trilogy. So Before Sunrise, Before Sunset, and Before Midnight, all written and directed by Richard Linklater and co-written and starring Ethan Hawke and Julie Delpy. These are some of my favorite movies to watch. I just watched them the other night all in one sitting because <laughs> they are quite short, especially Sunset. It's actually only 80 minutes. But it works that way for a specific reason. But all the films are an out. The other films are ninety minutes, so they're quick watches. But they're perfect from start to finish. And they're some of the most incredible romance films, but also relationship films because they feel so raw. They feel so real. And it's like the dialogue and situations that are captured in these films by these three great artists are so relatable and so true to life. There's no BS movie dialogue. It's just people. Especially these two people who make connect, who make a connection over and, and portraying that connection over a series of decades. And for me, they are still just one of my greatest comfort watches. True love is a classic concept and motif in cinema, especially in romantic films. But what I love about the Before trilogy is Richard Linklater, Ethan Hawke, Julie Delpy, they bring so much reality and realism to love, to relationships, because, of course, before sunrise, as these two characters, they meet on a train, they have this incredible night in Vienna, maybe to never see each other again. Then they link up nine years later in Paris, and they rekindle what they once had after they'd been pining for each other for nine years, each writing, one person writing a book, the other person writing a song. And then before midnight follows them after they've been together and they have a family, but what I love so much about the trilogy, it kind of flips on its head that, you know, happy, not necessarily a happy ending, but true love always means you'll feel that same way forever. That what you had, that flame you had when you first met will last your entire lives together when it's not real. It, it, what reality is and what they do here is bring the truth to love, bring the truth to marriages or relationships, partnerships. They're not married, but they're a partnership. They're life partners. And that's what I think I find so special because a lot of people maybe be dissuade from finding a life partner, maybe, maybe dissuade from falling in love with somebody when they watch this trilogy because of what happens to Celine and Jesse by Before Midnight, when really, I think for me, I'm more interested in love because it's hard, it's difficult, nothing worth doing is easy. And I think that's what this trilogy shows is it brings reality and the truth to relationships and especially in a photo world or a, a social media world everyone looks so happy online these couples they're always smiling but then a month later they're divorced they're, they're like wait what up? happened like, what <laughs> because that's not reality i thought you just went on a trip to cabo together <laughs> but i think what's, what's so special about love and, and having a partner and a significant other is getting through the tough times yeah any relationship it's not perfection and i think we see so many films especially in the romance genre where you know it might be difficult for the couple to get together like that's the story arc of like a romance film but once they get together it's just apparently happily ever after in perfection and and we found our each other we're our soulmates and everything's gonna be good from now on and that's not at all the reality there are in any relationship there will be good moments and then there will be bad moments and it's a way of working through that and if you truly love someone you can get past that and you can find like a middle ground and I think they address it really well with these films, and each film has its own major theme. I actually got a, a comment on my letterbox from Adonis, a listener of ours, and he summed it up perfectly. He said that sunri before sunrise is fantasy, before sunset is hope, and before midnight is reality. And Ethan Hawke also said something similar in an interview where he described before sunrise as a film of what might be and what could be. Before sunset was a, f was a film about what should be, and then Before Midnight is a film about what it really is. And I love that each film has a different theme based upon how we look at relationships. Because you, when you start dating someone, you have the fantasy of them in your mind. And when you first meet them, and the fantasy is so alluring, and you're just in your head, you're simulating events, you're simulating how things will go, and it all goes well. It's all fantastic. But then, as you get to know someone, you're like, okay, Let's drop our expectations down a little bit. And then when you're in a long-term relationship, you're like, okay, it's not the courtship phase anymore. 
but we're going to do the best we can to share a life together because ultimately what you know a partnership is is sharing your life with someone else and there's going to be um ways around working towards conflicts and situations where you're trying to mold each other and fit into each other's shapes of their lives and sometimes it's difficult sometimes it doesn't work out but sometimes it does work out and even the ones that do work out they take work and i think before midnight does a wonderful job of exploring how you know where we thought they were they were star-crossed lovers and they could still be but that doesn't mean it's easy and that doesn't mean that everything was just copacetic from from day one when they started actually dating and at the end of before, before sunset so i love how we get these different themes for each film and i have some great synopses for each of these movies that i pulled from the criterion collection so i want to oh, talk yeah. about just set them up really quick and, and before then... a, a trilogy has amazing criterion art for oh yeah covers. they have great art absolutely beautiful art now before sunrise came out in 1995 an exquisitely understated ode to the thrill of romantic possibility the inaugural installment of the before trilogy opens with a chance encounter between two solitary young strangers after they hit it off on a train bound for Vienna, the Paris University student Celine and the scrappy American tourist Jesse impulsively decide to spend a day together before he returns to the U.S. the next morning. As the pair roam the streets of the stately city, Richard Linklater's tenderly observant gaze captures the uncertainty and intoxication of young love from the first awkward stirrings of attraction to the hopeful promise that Celine and Jesse make upon their inevitable parting we all know how that film ends where they decide throughout the course of the film which we'll talk about how we shouldn't even exchange information we're never going to see each other that always makes it fizzle out and that's kind of fate maybe if they did exchange information it would have fizzled out so yeah. i love that concept which we'll get into because there's so much to discuss now before sunset came out nine years later in 2004 in the breathtaking follow-up to Before Sunrise, Celine tracks down Jesse, now an author, at the tail end of his book tour in Paris, with only a few hours left before he is to board a flight back home to the States. Meeting almost a decade after their short-lived romance in Vienna, the pair find their chemistry rekindled by increasingly candid exchanges about professional setbacks, marital disappointments, and the compromises of adulthood. Now, in this film, Jesse is married with a son, where Celine's in a relationship with a photojournalist. Impelled by an urgent sense of transience of human connection, Before Sunset remains Richard Linklater's most seductive experiment with time's inexplore, inexorable passage and the way love can seem to stop it in its tracks. And what I love about, sun about Sunset real quick is its use of time really in being in real time versus the other two are the course of like, you could say 12 hours or something or a little longer. They don't cut to a different scene. It just is a constant flow of time. And we'll talk about time in all three films in a bit. Now We have Christopher Nolan to join us. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so when we revert it before midnight, we're going backwards <laughs> through time. <laughs> it's invert, Jim. Inver no, we're reverting because we were inverted now we're gonna revert oh you're right revert yes yeah, we're going back in time man sorry that's why we have chris here yeah yeah, yeah. help clear it up <laughs> chris can you can you feel sun now before midnight came out nine years after before sunset in 2013 and yes they have missed the deadline to come out with the fourth nine years later who knows we'll ever get another one the conclusion of the before trilogy finds celine and jesse several years into a relationship and in the midst of of a sun-dappled Greek retreat with their twin daughters and a group of friends. The couple soon find their vacation upended, however, by long simmering problems that come to a boil, marked by an emotional depth, piercing wit, and conversational exuberance that Linklater and his actors honed over two decades of abiding with these characters. Before Midnight grapples with the complexities of long-term intimacy and asks what becomes of love when it has no recourse to its past illusions. Love that. By the way, if you're watching us, I feel like we both have Jesse's hairstyles. You have the before sunrise hair, <laughs> and I have the before sunset hair. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And the before sunrise film was inspired by true life experiences from both director Linklater and co-writer on that film and the second film, Kim Kurzan. So Richard Linklater spent a night walking around Philadelphia with a woman named Amy, a woman he randomly met. And then Kim, Kim Kurzan rode around Europe on trains meeting people and on one of these days, she met a Norwegian man on the way to Paris and ended up walking around the city all night, just like before sunrise. Kim Kurzan has never revealed whether she and that man maintained a romance. However, Linklater had a more tragic instance in real life. Real life. So Linklater, after that night with Amy, he just had that idea in his head and he finally wrote the film. And he was in production on Before Sunrise. And 
he hopes, just like how Jesse in Before Sunset reveals to um, Celine that he wrote this book on the hopes that she would find him one day, maybe on a book tour, somehow reach out to him. So that's his main motivation for writing that book about their night together in Before Sunset. Linklater has a similar experience where he hoped that the real-life Amy would find out about this movie and attend one of the premieres or screenings. However, she never showed up. And even when Before Sunset came out, he hoped maybe maybe now she knows and maybe now she'll show up to the Before Sunset premiere. However, ne Amy never showed up to the Before Sunset premiere either. Le after the Sunset premiere, he, was, ca he came into contact with a friend of Amy who saw the films and realized that this is what this story was about. It was, it was their friend Amy. Sadly, they revealed to Richard Linklater that Amy had died in a motorcycle accident at the age of 24. So she actually passed away before Sunrise, before before Sunrise ever came out. So sadly, Richard Linklater's true life story didn't mirror Jesse's kind of finding his long lost, long distance love. Uh, but it still made for an exceptional story in a way to bounce off for the second and third films. It's really tragic. But it's so fascinating that it happened to them in real life. Both of them. I didn't know that about the uh, other co-writers. Yeah. As well. So Kim Kim Krizan, she she was a co-writer on the first two films, and then for the third film, it was just Linklater and the actors. Very cool. Now I love the titles of these movies. They're perfect, and they they're very symbolic and metaphorical about this connection between Jesse and Celine. Now, what are the meanings of these titles, and what does it have to do with the part of day? So for me. Jesse and Celine have to establish their connections before the certain point of these days. So in the first film, Jesse and Celine have to establish their connection and love before the moments of sunrise when Jesse has to leave Vienna and go to America. Then the second film and before sunset, they have to establish their connection and love again before sunset that afternoon, that late afternoon, early evening, when Jesse has to get on a plane from Paris and go back to the United States. And then in before midnight, Jesse and Celine have to establish their love and connection once more time, however, this time before midnight after that long fight in the hotel and after Celine says, I don't think I love you anymore, and they're on that little cafe on the water and midnight's approaching, they have to establish their connection again. So what I really like about the titles and how they relate to their connection, their love, is it's kind of a time limit. There's a ticking yeah. clock on they have to get this going, they have to figure this out before sunrise, before sunset, and before midnight. Yeah, and the way I look at them is before sunrise means uh, sunrise represents the end of the fantasy. So this fantasy, it's a dream-like night. It's a, it's a, it is a dream. And sunrise represents waking up to reality of, you know, this is, it's just a fantasy. And so I, that's how I look at before sunrise. Before sunset, I look as like it's a ticking clock of we only have so much time today together until the day is over. And again, just the reality of this is going to end today. And then before midnight, you can look at as parents with kids and then... When you're a parent, your your kids are your life, and so it, the only time they have to actually communicate je the two of them alone is the couple hours before midnight, when the kids are in bed and they're just parents on their own. And so I look at midnight that way as it's like it's really the only time parents are alone together. And you can also say that it's a metaphor for their love as they age. You know, the sun's rising; it's newly born, this new love. And then sunset, it's rising to a peak before it starts to go down, like this honeymoon phase, and then slowly falling until it extinguishes. And can they reignite that flame again by the end of the film? That's why I love the ambiguity of every single ending yeah. of these movies. They're all ambiguous. Will they see each other again after before sunrise? Is Jesse and Celine going to get together after the ending of Before Sunset when he's in their apartment and it fades to black? And then at the end of Before Midnight, is their marriage going to survive? And you can look at Midnight as Midnight is... I mean, uh, not marriage. They're not married. They're partners. Yeah, yeah. Midnight represents the the end of the previous day so once you have once there's midnight it's a new day so midnight could represent this this is the end of the relationship can we settle it before midnight can we settle it before it's too late before it's done uh, there's a few things that i really love that about this movie there's a lot obviously <laughs> but first of all i love how these are american films but they're not set in america they're all in different cities. I mean, we're in Vienna in one and on a train going through parts of Europe and then Paris. And then we're in Greece in uh, Pel Peloponnese. And Very what nice. I also adore about this film is non-English languages are not translated with subtitles because it's reality. It's real. You don't walk around with subtitles. 
You're walking around. We you might one day, but not right now. You don't understand what anyone's saying. Yeah. And so, like, even with the opening of Before Sunrise, you don't know what this German couple is fighting about to cause Celine to get frustrated and move to the back of the compartment to sit next to Jesse. You don't know what everyone's saying in French. You don't even know what Celine's usually saying in French. You get the gist, kind of, if they're in a cafe, she's ordering coffee. But I love how the English, non-English languages are not translated in these films. I like that, too. And some filmmakers like to do that. The, I think the most famous example is the Michael's um, restaurant scene in the first Godfather film uh, right before he kills the yeah. two men there. He doesn't translate most of that Italian. If not, I don't think he translates any of the Italian. Maybe a little bit. I think – I'm trying to think. I, I think he does a couple like a of lines. There's a couple lines here and there. But the, the majority 90, of it's not translated. Yeah, 90% of it's not translated because you don't need to know. You, you get the gist of it. Just like we don't need to know what the couple's arguing about. We don't need to know what the barista is saying. <laughs> like, really. We understand what's happening when someone orders coffee and tea. We understand what's going on. So we don't need the language. And it puts you into Jesse's shoes as a surrogate for him as well. And for Celine because she doesn't completely yes. understand German. I mean, yeah. And, the, so. and then in Vienna, like, they don't speak... Um, Speaking their the, the English is it German? They, yeah, they speak German in okay. Vienna. <laughs> they don't speak Viennese. <laughs> Wait, Vienna is in Germany. Well, no, it's it's no. Vienna is in Austria, Anthony. Austria, thank you. <laughs> but they speak they speak German yeah. in Austria. So it could be Austrian though. <laughs> it could be either one. Well, they speak. I'm pretty sure most of them speak German there. There's but there's an Austrian. True. Verb. Yeah, but I, I mean, mean Germany took it over. Um, someone's gonna correct us. In the comments. <laughs> <laughs> Look at these fucking dumb Americans. No, they're speaking German in, yeah, yeah. in Austria. Oh, yeah, I get it. Yeah, yeah. But. If anyone's curious about the German couple in the opening of Before Sunrise, what they're arguing about, I looked up actually. So if you want to keep the mystery, cover your ears or just turn the volume down or skip ahead. But the German couple on the train are fighting about, I believe I read that the husband is reading a newspaper and it said something about how many married women are alcoholics in this country that they're living in, in Austria, I think. And then they start getting into a fight because he's like, oh, you're one of them. You drink so much. And she's like, I drink so much because I'm married to you. And then <laughs> she calls him an alcoholic. And then they get into a fight about how they can't stand each other, basically. But what I also love about this is, is it potentially, I don't know if they plan to make three of these movies. Who knows? But it could be a great foreshadow, accidental, or maybe they built it's off. It's a bookmark. Or they yeah. built off the for, these moments in the first film to foreshadow later on to the third film and second films where – you know, this couple can't stand each other anymore. But you can assume at one point they loved each other very, very much, just like Celine and Jesse. And then at the end of the third film, they get in this huge argument, this huge blow up. But is it fate that this couple got into this argument to cause Celine to sit in the back of the compartment next to Jesse? And then ironically, they end up becoming that couple to an extent later on in their lives. Yeah, I mean, they argue in public. They don't have the big blowout in public, obviously, but they they are bicker. They, bicker, they are yeah. bickering. It is. It's pretty. It's pretty intense. What they are arguing about in the cafe area on the water, but they're keeping their voices down. Like nobody knows what's going on, but they are going at it. It's. And I think one of the most. The one of the whole. Probably the most heartbreaking parts of the entire trilogy are in that that fight where, in the hotel, Celine says, "I don't think I love you anymore." Close the door, and then Jesse realizes, "Oh, she's she's not coming back in like she did twice before." And then in the cafe area, the bar area, when Jesse is trying to make her laugh with the time traveler joke, and she's like, "I don't, I want nothing. I don't want any deal with any of this right now. Not now." And he just goes, "I'm just trying to make you laugh. This is this is what it is. Like this is love. You can accept it or not." And him, he he gave up. Jesse is always so. What's different about them is, and showcase in all the films how different they are. Jesse's an optimist. And Celine is more of a cynic. Ah, I kind of disagree but, with you. But, but, but Celine is spiritual, whereas Jesse is religious. But I would say Jesse is much more of an optimist, and he's always trying to make the best of things. And Celine is, I think, a little bit more of a nihilist and a little bit more of a cynic and how she views the world. And a great there's great correlations where how they he says she's like, the world's falling apart, things are worse than ever. And, and then Jesse's like, there are things... There's shit going on, but there are things to be good, happy about in the world. You know what I mean? So they are very different personalities. And Linklater and company showcased it in every one of the films. Another example ha is how um, Celine was open to the palm reader, but Jesse hated the palm reader because he doesn't believe in spirituality. But Celine clearly, clearly is very spiritual, even though she is a cynic. And then Jesse is an, an is an optimist, even though he doesn't believe in spirituality. So they have very different 
um, qualities and personalities, yet they still work as a couple. I disagree with you. I think the first film, before Sunrise, Jesse's the cynic, and Celine's the hopeful one. You and might then be right, by the yeah. end of the, and then the trilogy, and then at the end, and before midnight, now Celine's the cynical one, and Jesse's the hopeful one. You're the, fucking right. And the first, that's why it's yes. great writing. Yes. So yes. let me explain a little further. So like you're talking about, so with Jesse in the first film, you know, when you're like fall for somebody early and you're those early phases you have those blinders on you don't see the little little things that you kind of bicker about they kind of bicker a little bit yes. in the first film you know and they're all about things that jesse doesn't agree with because they're not based on pragmatism something practical you know what i mean so like the palm reading he tears that apart like you don't actually believe in that stuff very cynical and then same thing with the poet he probably just wrote that and he just plugs that word in every you know, he time. didn't really just write that like you don't think that but celine every time she believes in it and then also they talk about love. Jesse says, I don't want to fall in love right now. He doesn't know if he wants to fall in love. He's more focused on being remembered for something. He wants to be remembered for art and eventually obviously being a writer. Whereas Celine, Like the idols that he looks up exactly, to. Exactly. Yes. Celine wants to find love. Even though she says she doesn't want to with everybody and a lot of people hide that fact, she says something along the lines in Before Sunrise where finding love and being in love with somebody is like one of the most special things you can do and it's something that I really want to happen. Whereas before midnight, now Celine doesn't know if she loves Jesse anymore and Jesse's the one that's trying to keep hope alive. And, and she's very cynical of everything now. And he's trying to use, in a way, he's trying to create poetry just like that poet it's a joke, but he's using a poetic joke to try to make her laugh and try to break through her new wall, shutting him down. That's it. You're absolutely right. They he's do absolutely change. Right. He's, he's absolutely right. <laughs> they do completely change because they'll have an opinion on one thing in the first film, and then even in Sunset, they'll change their opinion of that thing. So, and that's what happens. In, in, as we, we all change. Our opinions change. We might be idealistic about one thing and then cynical about that same thing 10 years later. So... I think you're absolutely right. I definitely misinterpreted that a little bit because that's why, we're, that's why I'm here, man. That's why, that's why we're, we're a team. Bring out Chris. We're a team. <laughs> we're a team. But no, you're absolutely right. He is definitely the cynic because he shuts down a lot of things that she celebrates in the first film, and then they're kind of evening out and going. And they're both approaching the middle ground of both the spectrums of all these ideas, and then by the third film. They are on complete opposite sides of the spectrums, I think. And I think because Celine, she's, though constant in her life from start to finish, she's always been a very strong, active feminist. And that's one of the thorough lines for her character throughout. And that's something Jesse has always kind of, I think he joked about it in the first couple of films. He would joke about feminism. He even jokes about with the time travel joke. Exactly. And your daughters are examples of feminism. Yeah, exactly. And then in the third film, he can't stand it anymore. He's he he and then in that big hotel fight, he's like berating her about how and ridiculous it's getting. Growing to be. up in middle class Paris. Yeah, he's like, please tell so me tough. how tough it was. <laughs> so by the third film, he's sick of it. That's something that happens in relationships where something you think is cute at first and something is it's like, okay, I don't I'm not really agreeing with that thing they do or that thing they have an opinion about but you know it's cute it's them it's what makes them them 10 years later you can't stand it about that person i think an example of that is there's the she likes the red in his beard in the first film before sunrise she loves it and she even like caresses his beard a couple of times she thinks it's cute but by the third film she always complains about him not being clean shaven but she also complains that the red's gone. The red's gone. It's blonde now. Yeah, it's blonde. But she does say she sees the red in the daughter's eyebrows, and it reminds her of that night. But to be, but an example of like she thought it was cute to have facial hair. Fifteen years ago, eighteen years ago, but now she complains. Can you please be like my husband still doesn't know how to be clean shaven? <laughs> so it's something that that's an example of I like this about you back then, but now it's like it drives me nuts. It's also very contradictory for Celine. Yes. And it's a great ir irony with the first film where and before sunrise, you know, they're they're having this incredible night and they're talking about like, oh, if we like got together and stayed together forever. Jesse's like, you would start to get sick of me. You would think all these little things of me saying the same story over and over again that you've heard a dozen times to our friends. And when we have guests over and you get sick of my little nuances and the things I do. And she says, actually, I think that I would love you even more. And I would love the 10th the time you told that story. And the, I would love when you do this over and over again. So because I think they're both blinded by the fantasy of 
life of love and true love and soulmates potentially that they're not seeing they're not speaking the truth to themselves because obviously they do get sick of those things and she does as well and also the gender norms take a toll on celine when she becomes a mother and she becomes basically the housekeeper of the home even though jesse does spend a lot of time at home He's not really taking care of the home and kids. He's more of like watching the kids. And she's like, I love it. Men just think they're little fairies that pick up after them and clean the dishes and put the laundry away. Just little fairies. And so it's difficult for her to deal with because sometimes motherhood can just be too much on a woman, especially if the husband isn't putting in the work to help out. And so I think it's difficult for her to deal with the fact that motherhood and being the partner to this man I'm really taking on all of these things that I didn't want to take on, and it's not, it's, the balance isn't fair. Not to mention it's twins. Exactly. An, an example of that is in Greece, what are they both doing in the afternoon? He's hanging out with the other guys, and they're just literally chilling, talking shop for hours, and the women are all preparing the meals, and they're all cooking. They're all making the salads. They're prepping the food. And so... That's something like Celine's happy to do it. She's happy to feed her family for sure. But it's something she's like, this isn't fair. Like, I'm always the one who's always cooking. You never cook. And so I think the gen the traditional gender norms, I think she's someone who, being such a strong feminist, she's like, that's never going to happen to me. You know what I mean? She's She never saw that in her life. Like, yes, open a motherhood, but she never thought that she'd be the person who would be cooking every meal, cleaning up after everyone. Those are the things that she probably saw her for herself in her future marriage. I would find a husband who would balance that with me. But unfortunately with Jesse, he became, he, he, he fell into that gender role of I'm the, I'm a bigger provider. I'm there, but I'm not doing all of the work in the house. And she was clearly looking for someone who could split that. And Jesse might've seemed like he could be like that. But ultimately when it came down to it, 18 years later, he ended up being a father and a partner who just let her do everything. Yeah, and also he gets to travel. Yes. Go away. And she has that great monologue about how he's off on his book tours doing what, and she's home with these infant twins. She has no idea what she's supposed to do. And she says, you know, when you give birth and you become a mother, I thought instincts would click in and I'd know exactly what to do. But I'm, I was so scared. I was alone. I had these twins. I, I couldn't get them to be quiet. I had to take this carriage down the stairs and just take them for walks in the middle of the night to get them to be quiet. Janice, mom, I'm sure that this was really hard on you as well. And with six. I, and it's clear that Celine and before or midnight is probably still suffering from postpartum depression. She says she's still not over the birth of the twins. And I can only imagine what that, that toll that it has on a woman, especially if you're spending a good part of it when they're young and early and infants by yourself at home trying to figure out and your husband's off. You know, he's a very successful guy, but he's off on book tours. He's away a lot. He comes home sporadically and he's not there to help and to support physically. He's there on the phone, but She's too afraid to tell him how she really feels, how scared shitless she is because she wants to stay strong for the family. So you can argue that she still is going through postpartum depression before midnight. And what's interesting is before sunrise is clearly it's obviously the, the most romantic and the most dreamy. But it works because when you're young, especially if you're still in school, you have such less responsibilities. You have such so much less to worry about. You haven't really faced the real world yet. And so you have that ease about you that Jesse and Celine have, but especially Jesse. And you see how that transforms over time. By the second film, by Before sun sun Sunset, there's romantic moments to it, but it's more of... It's less romantic for sure, but it still has that there. But they're talking about but their it, relationships. It's more about the, being an adult now. They're growing into adulthood. They're 32 now. And so things have changed. And it's not all about romance. It's not all about dreaminess. It's about, you know, we're people in the world now. And then by before midnight, I think that a problem with marriage and, and, and difficulty with having kids is it can suck the romance completely out of your relationship. And this is an example of by before midnight, their romance is gone. And there may be hints of it, but they're struggling to hold on to it. And take an example of when they get to the hotel room. It's a nice hotel room. They're both like, oh, my God, this is so great. 
I love this hotel room. It was so generous of our friends to book this for us. But then at the end of the fight, they're like, this hotel room is ridiculous. What do they expect from us? Give us wine. And what do they expect us to do? Like the idea of romance is completely gone. And even the idea of sex in the first film, it's like this thing they both really want. And it's a, a magical thing, and when they do do it, it's like a, it's an incredible experience. But by the third film, although it's, it's ambiguous until it, yeah, until the second film, second second film, until Celine finally l- reveals that she was lying, and they actually did it twice, dummy. <laughs> <laughs> but by the third film, uh, even the r- romance in this in the intimacy is gone, where it's become so by the motions, where even Celine complains that like you're you're just kissy kissy titty titty pussy pussy. There's like it's become like such a routine that all of the special qualities of the intimacy have been sucked away as well. Plus, a lot of their intimacy that they built was just walking around talking about whatever. Those philosophical musings of talking about life, about relationships, about what they want to do in the future, but also learning about each other that happens in the first film. A good amount of that in the second film, for sure, they still do that as well as bringing in like what their lives are like now and talking about how unhappy they are with their relationships. But then the third film, they're just talking about their day-to-day lives. And it's hard, like you said earlier, they are never alone almost until the until they get to the hotel and their friends offer to babysit the kids. And it's probably the first time they've been alone actually besides, you know, tired, get home from work, put the kids to bed, and we're in the bed like before we go to sleep, like exhausted. So it's the first night they've like been alone probably in a long time. Yeah, and I think that's a struggle with all marriages when you have kids, you know, it's, trying yeah. to find that time to be alone because when you're young, you're alone all the time. You have all the time in the world to be together. And then Celine even says while they're walking to the hotel, when was the last time we actually just did this, just walk around talking shit? It's been a long time. No, yes, yeah, when they're walking around that archaeological site, and when it's like just like back in the day. Yeah, finally. And they're walking to the hotel yeah. that night. Yeah, I love how I love the opening driving scene because uh, first they the kids wanted to go to the to that site. Yeah, and they're like they're asleep. They're like let's skip it. Let's skip it. You see them once, see them all, and then gotta, he, gotta he, teach them character. You yeah, snooze you lose. <laughs> you snooze you lose, and then he eats her apple. And then the kids wake up. They're like, "What about the 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 site, the the archaeological site?" They're like, "Oh, it was closed." And like, "Could I have my apple? <laughs> oh, your apple? <laughs> what happened? It's to, what happened to our apple?" <laughs> I, but that's an example of so before midnight, we open the airport. But then we get that great. I think it's like a, a twelve minute scene of them talking while driving in the car, and that's the strength to the films. All of them is Linklater's love for long takes, and they're actually very difficult to pull off, especially this long. They're walking through different areas. The carnival one, I think it might be the most impressive because the lighting for that must have taken a long time to get right. And obviously people discuss about how authentic the dialogue is in this film and how it feels just so real. But famously, all three of them, Linklater, Delby, and Hawk, have always said that the all of the films are rehearsed thoroughly in every line, every time they maybe interrupt each other, every breath, every beat. It is all rehearsed to the T, and there really is, they've all said there's no improvisation whatsoever in any of the films. It's all just very meticulous, and that's really, I think, a a necessity for the film. First of all, it shows how impressive the performers are, because it just looks like two people talking, but somehow, it's just, it's unbelievable to believe that it's all so precise because of how fluid and natural Delpy and Hawk are, but that they're just some of the best at, at their game, and then... The intricacy of the long takes, it has to be precise, especially when they're moving through different environments like walking through a neighborhood in Paris or moving through these streets in Vienna or traveling through the ruins in Greece. Oftentimes, their environment will inform what they're discussing, so they have to time it perfectly, and they have to get the moments precise because then the long takes don't work. And the long takes are great. Before Sunset has the longest one, it has a a 12-minute long take. And then the other films... Even though they won't hit that many minutes, many of the shots are six minutes long, seven minutes long. And those are just so long compared to other films, but also allows them to shoot very quickly before midnight, before sunset and before midnight shot in 15 days. Um, I'm sorry, sunset and midnight shot in 15 days. Sunrise, I think, shot in 20 days. So those are insanely fast shooting schedules, but they're able to pull it off because Linklater is just doing one shot for the entire scene. It's terrific stuff. And speaking of openings and closings, I love how these films open and close and end. And they're actually, the first two are pretty connected. 
The third one opens and closes very different than the other two. Now, I want to get your opinion on why you think that, I think. So before sunrise opens with a shot of the train tracks moving as the train's going along, and then shots of the towns outside of the train as it's moving and traveling. And then the film ends with empty, very early morning static shots of all of the places that Celine and Jesse visited while in Vienna. So all the little locations that they had conversations, that they stopped. We get great shots of like this empty past, this this night that shouldn't have been because, you know, they talk about how they kind of stole time. It's sort of like they didn't exist in a way. So I love how the film ends with all these shots of the locations. And then before sunset opens with static shots of all the locations they're about to visit in Paris. And then it ends in Celine's apartment fading to black. So before sunset, when they eventually link up again at the bookstore and they go for their walk and talks and all the places they go, the, op- the movie opens with all the static shots of all those locations that they're about to visit. It's really fascinating. And then fading to black in Celine's apartment again. And it, 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 it fades to black when she's dancing in the apartment. Yeah. Like that's the last shot. Now, before midnight opens up on the feet of Jesse and his son at the airport as his son Hank is about to board a plane and leave to go back to the United States to stay with his, go back to his mom. And it ends on the waterfront cafe after the fight and going back to playing those make-believe games they used to play when they first met. And the pullout. Yeah, the camera pull. What was the what's the opening shot exactly again? Of the feet, the feet of and then of of Jesse and his son, uh-huh, gotcha. of Jesse and Hank, and then the camera comes up. So it's interesting, and I wonder why Linklater chose to not kind of do a similar little compilation With the locations. Of the locations. I would say because well, I would look. I look at the first film as the location shots. It reminds me of the scene when near the end of the film of Before Sunrise where Jesse and Celine take the mental photographs of each other. And so I look at it as like the camera is taking photographs of these moments of time throughout the city. And then the third, the third film to not do any of them, I think it's because um, maybe because the fantasy is gone. And so, and they do it in the second film because the fantasy is still alive. But now the third film, the fantasy is eliminated. There is no fantasy anymore. It's reality. And so I think he went for a more practical shot setup of the feet first and not showing the locations they visit as, at, at all. And then to end, and then you end, you, in the, before sunrise, you end on the fantasy with the location shots. And before sunset, you end on Celine because they're about to start a relationship. It's about to begin. And then before midnight, you end on the couple because they are together now. And I think, I think for me, the ending of Before Midnight is an answer that they will stay together. I think they're, they'll be able to rekindle their passion, their love. And for me, the static shots in the first two films of the places they visited or are about to visit, I think they have to do with time and how in the first film they talk about how this shouldn't exist. What we did, we've stolen time. We've made our own time, kind of our own reality, our own little alternate dimension. And it still continues in Before Sunset. You know, should they have done this because he was supposed to get on that plane? He doesn't get on that plane, doesn't go to the airport. He misses his flight. So they stole time again. And so they get shots of these locations where they technically shouldn't have existed. And then before midnight, they're together. So they've, they're part of time now. They've created time. Also... It opens on the feet of Jesse and Hank, his son, because Hank's relationship with Jesse is the main point of contention and conflict for the film. So I think that's why they open with that, because they could have, op- they could have opened with Jesse and Celine. But I think Linklater chose the feet of Jesse and Hank because that was the boiling point for beginning the conflict of the film. Jesse's so. Jesse's disappointment of not being there for him anymore and wanting to be with him longer. And that creates the whole crescendo of Celine being threatened, of Jesse's implying maybe we should move to America and she doesn't want to. And then that starts the entire conflict of the film. I like that. I like the interpretations. How about we uh, take a break, head to our intermission, have some fun games, and we'll come back to the Before Trilogy. And before we continue, the very best way that you can support Raiders of the Lost podcast is share our show with your family and friends who love movies. It's the best way to help our podcast flourish and grow. 
and go to the moon. So thank you so much to everyone who shares us as well as leaving us those five-star reviews and ratings on Spotify and Apple Podcasts, aka iTunes. Apple Podcasts, you can leave a written review, which we love to read out. I'm going to get to one in about a minute. You can also become a patron at patreon.com slash Raiders of the Lost Podcast. Patreon is a subscription-based form of support for us where every patron has access to over 200 bonus episodes of the show. We post two a week that every single patron has access to. We have five different tiers of membership, $2, $5, $10, $25, and $100. That $10 tier gets you access to our Discord community. It's private, but only people in that minimum of $10 have access. We do watch parties on there, chat with you all the time. It's so much fun. $25, you get a custom episode. $100, you get so many perks as well as a private watch party. And after a few months, after three months, you get to come on the show for a fun guest segment. Patreon's the reason Patreon's the reason why we do the show full time. So thank you so much for your support. We also have a Patreon Spotify page now. It's called Raiders of the Lost Patreon. <laughs> All patrons have access. If you want to find it, find a link on one of our posts. It'll have all of our bonus episodes on a Spotify page now. And this episode is sponsored by our friends at MoviePosters.com, the number one place to get your posters online today. Be sure to use our promo code RAIDERS10 to get 10% off your order today. MoviePosters.com has a huge selection of pretty much every movie and TV show imaginable in their poster library, as well as all sorts of sizes, framing, and even backlighting for your poster needs. MoviePosters.com also does a bi-monthly movie poster giveaway to our fans. We just had one the other day. I want to say congratulations to our poster winner. One sec, I'm pulling it up. Wow. <laughs> one sec, sorry. Who was it, Anthony? Hurry up, man. <laughs> I got places to be. It was... How... <laughs> All of Olivier... Olivier Gratton, congrats on your poster. He shows a really cool one. And we're going to do another poster giveaway next week, so stay tuned for that. And in the meantime, use our promo code RAIDERS10 at MoviePosters.com to get 10% of your, off your order right now. And let's get into the intermission and begin with the movie release year competition. Quote first. Movie quote competition. Sorry, I scrolled, over the place. I scrolled too low down my page. It sounded weird coming out of my mouth. You said it weird, too. Movie quote competition. Ready? Nature made me a freak. Man made me a weapon. And God made it last too long. <laughs> um, shit. Say it again? Nature made me a freak. Man made me a weapon. And God made it last too long. Logan? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I was like, well, who does that apply to? <laughs> All right, here's my quote. Two people talking. How would you like to die? Old. You chose the wrong profession. To die. Old. You chose the wrong profession. Pissed off when you have to tell me the answer. What is it? Tenet. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. All right. Indeed. Guess this movie release year, Anthony. Mystic River. 2002. 2003 was the correct answer. John, is that my John? Is, is John? that my John? John, is John? that? Tell me that's not my John. <laughs> John. <laughs> All right, what year did Wild Wild West come out? Wild Wild West, 1990, is it six or five? Oh, no, Wild Wild West, 1999. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you, did you say 65 in your head? No, six or five. Oh, six or five. <laughs> All right. Uh, oh, movie pop quiz time. Oh, yeah. Anthony, who directed The Wizard of Oz? Oh, man, I don't know. Frank Capra? Nope. Victor Fleming. Fleming, of course. I don't think anyone knows the answer to that question. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what do uh, we got? Oh, your pop quiz time. What Marvel movie did Julie Delpy star in? Co-star in. Julie Delpy in Julie a Delpy. Marvel movie? Yes. 
I feel like this is a trick question. It's true. Well, it's, I feel like it's not an MCU movie. It's um, an MCU movie. It's an MCU Marvel movie. It's an MCU Marvel movie with the Avengers in it. That Julie Delpy's in. Julie Delpy's in it. Julie Delpy from the Before Trilogy. Yes, indeed. The French from actress. The same movie that we're talking about in this episode. That what Julie fucking Delpy. MCU movie is she in? Holy She's shit. She's in one. Oh, my God. Um, hold on. Let me, let me think. Let me try to go through them all in my head. You got Which this, one man. would she be in? She's... I don't know. You tell me, man. <laughs> um, Ultron? Yes! Nice. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Complete no, guess. No, Ultron. <laughs> I'm going to say it way more confidently now. I know it is Ultron. <laughs> it is a fact. It, it is Ultron. So she played Natasha Romanoff's like, instructor at the Black Widow School. Of course. That's right. Yes, yeah. I remember that completely. <laughs> From your favorite Marvel I movie. I don't remember that at all. <laughs> Me either. I had to fucking Google it. I wow. Was like, what? That was a straight up fucking guess. Yeah. Hey, great guess, man. <laughs> Thanks, man. This is 27, like 32 movies to choose from. Although I did say the Avengers were in it, so that narrowed it yeah, down. Yeah, narrowed it down. Plus, I know it's not Iron Man. But I think my hint helped a lot. A bit. All there, the, I said the Avengers were in it. So there you were knew, like eight of them. You knew it was an Avengers movie. Can you just say it was a good guess? It was a, it was a great guess. You got it right. Thanks, bro. It couldn't have been a better guess. <laughs> <laughs> it's the ultimate guess. Best guess you could have done. Best guess ever. All right. <laughs> Anthony, besides you, do we have any uh, Raider haters this week? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we got some good ones. All right, so. Uh, RJ Leet Jiu-Jitsu wrote in your Hugh Jackman clip, Huge Jackman, by the way. Time to unsubscribe. And I replied, actually, it's Huge Jackman. Huge Jackman. <laughs> Jackman. <laughs> and then... Stop Motion Wizard in our Barbie episode. You almost forgot to mention Alan. Unsubscribed. <laughs> Jen Mania commented when we were trying to figure out uh, what sushi restaurant in Boston we went to for the first time. And I said it was Elephant Walk. She said, Elephant, she's from Boston. She said, Elephant Walk doesn't serve sushi. It's Cambodian French cuisine. Unsubscribed. And I was correct, by the way. It was Bon Thai bon on Main Street. Thank bon you so much. You're I, right. I was right. Our brother. Anthony our... tried to. <laughs> I didn't try to say you're wrong. Yeah, go, just, you said, no, you're wrong, Jim. You're so wrong. <laughs> I, you were like, no, I said, I think it's Bon, I think it's bon Thai is what I was saying. Yeah. No, you, no, you, no, you, you it's, said it's Elephant Walk. I said it's yeah. Bon Thai. You yeah. said, Jim, you're an idiot. <laughs> it's not Bon Thai. I got in there. We had some real haters, though, on Instagram. The Graham. I had to just, the, I had to block them on Instagram. How bad were they? I made a clip of talking about Dunkirk's long take and I said in the clip that Christopher Nolan does not use you're not going to see a bunch of uh, long takes in Nolan movies it's absolutely true and these guys these two guys on Instagram they went at me they're like they meant they were mentioning entire scenes they're like the dream sequence in its inception the bank robbery in Dark Knight and they're, they're like, you're like so wrong. Cause the, first they, first they said, you're, you, they said, did this guy just say there are no long takes in a Nolan movie? Get this guy out a of here. A long take is like over two minutes in my opinion. Yeah. At least it, a minute. Yeah. At least a Nolan minute. doesn't really do minute long but takes. But then, but then I said, please, d please mention, please tell me these long takes if they apparently exist. And then they mentioned like entire sequences of movies. And then I would, then I replied to them, guys, a long take means an uncut take of a shot by the camera. These, I, these are scenes you're talking about. I'm talking about when the camera doesn't cut. And they said, well, you worded it confusingly. I mean, everybody here is confused. And I said, there are only two people. This, this, view, this video has 50,000 views. There are only two people who are confused. It's you two. Whenever somebody <laughs> says the word long take, they mean a long take that doesn't cut. You guys have no idea what I'm talking about, so don't get mad at me for it. But then they were destroying me, so then I just blocked them on Instagram. Wow. It's like, what a bunch of idiots. Seriously, a long take is a long take. They were like listing off scenes from the movies. I'm trying to think of what Nolan's longest take is in a movie. He doesn't do a ton. And there's nothing wrong with that. Even the hallway scene in Inception, that long take is only 17 seconds. Yeah, and that, that's just cut up like crazy. But no, no, there's a, there's a 17 second shot. No, but like yeah. still cut up like crazy. Yeah, he that never scene. does long takes. Never does it. I, 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 it's you gotta, go, a minute. His, you gotta just, go at least a minute. Come on. It's just not his style. He doesn't do it. You don't have to. Exactly. You don't have to. What a bunch of morons. Seriously. Anyways, let's go on to a great five-star review from the exact opposite kind of person. <laughs> from Dark Knight Freak. Five stars. <laughs> nice. Great. Speaking of, I love this podcast. They use so much depth. 
I really love the Dark Knight trilogy episode, hence my name. This is a good one. Thanks so much for the five star review, Dark Knight Freak. That's our best performing episode on YouTube, yeah. yeah. I actually have. Oppenheimer's our number one. I have a review. Someone tried to post on Apple, but it wouldn't work for them for submitting it, so I just they just sent it to me. It's pretty funny. Anonymous. Is it weird that I want them both to Eiffel Tower me? <laughs> <laughs> I don't do the rotisserie chicken because I'm vegan, but I've always wanted to go to Paris. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> they couldn't get it to post on Apple. Gotcha. It's pretty good. <laughs> but they wanted me to share it. It's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> All right, my. <laughs> My streaming recommendation for this episode is American Sniper. It just got added to Max, the one to watch for American Sniper. It's an excellent war film starring Bradley Cooper, directed by the great Clint Eastwood. Get off my lawn. It's my American Sniper. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Criterion Channel just added their new movies this month. They have a bunch of great movies to watch. I'm just going to recommend a few of them. They have Battle Royale now. They have Suspiria. They have Gloria. They have Duel, Spielberg's first film. They have The Faculty. They have Do the Right Thing, Boys in the Hood, The Craft, and Donnie Darko. So if you don't have Criterion Channel, go get it right now and watch all those movies. All right, I want to get back into the episode and start with love and true love. love. And obviously that's one of the main themes of this trilogy and this relationship, this connection between Jesse and Celine. Does true love exist? Can you fall in love with somebody at first sight? Can you really be connected to somebody so quickly? These are questions that I think a lot of people maybe have answers to in their experiences, in their lives. Maybe you have fallen in love with somebody very quickly. Maybe you have fallen in love at first sight. Maybe you haven't. But it's one of those things that's been prevalent in human history since civilization and stories and storytelling. Love, true love, soulmates, whether they exist or not, they've always been in the way humans express themselves. Do you believe in love at first sight? You know, it's one of those things that if you, I feel like if you believe in love at first sight, you really have to believe in a sort of spiritual connection because there would be a reason why. Like, I think love at first sight is if you believe in fate. If you believe in determinism, like you're meant to meet somebody and, and this trajectory has led both of you on your life courses to this moment of seeing each other and falling in love Im immediately. It's, it's, I wouldn't, because you can't I don't fully yeah. know somebody. Yeah. Exactly. I think that love at first sight, you might be in love with how they look. Yeah. <laughs> but love at first sight, you can't, you can't know them if you just look at them. So I, I don't believe in love at first sight. I yeah. think that's it's a ridiculous notion and it really doesn't make sense because you could love the way they look but then you talk to them for a minute you're like oh no like love well, you can but you can be if you fall in love with that person you'll be like oh it happened because we first when i first saw them but really you're just putting all of your new emotions and your your love for them into that first moment i believe in a connection at first sight sure and but or could you define that as just like walking down the street and locking eyes with somebody and the both of you are just not afraid to look away and like oh my god are we holding for three seconds are we meant to be in love are we in love right now is that what's happening and then right they turn now? the quarter and so, you never see them again <laughs> yeah <laughs> so but i think there's something about early connections i think that's an actual yeah. thing but i think it all comes down to with this trilogy about fate and determinism how i brought up earlier how this german couple fighting on the train if they don't get in that fight, Celine doesn't move to the back of the compartment. It doesn't mm -hmm. sit next to, to Jesse, and Jesse doesn't see Celine. They both kind of open their books, but their body language is facing the other person, like kind of an invitation to communicate. And Jesse finally works up the courage. If he didn't work up the courage, and I love how Link later kind of pushes the camera in on him, is like, all right, is he going to do it? Is he going to do it? Is he going to do it? And he finally says something to her. Hawk does a great job of portraying um, nervousness yeah. in the first film, like nervousness when they're first, especially when they're first talking. And I love the line before midnight. He's like, when game day arrived, I did it. I talked to you. I, I made it happen. He's like, he's still like impressed that he did it. He should be. Yeah, it's an like, impressive thing. I yeah. think a lot of people would the be Riz. afraid to do it. It's, it's the, yeah, the ultimate Riz. But, you know, I, I talked about earlier how in the first film we were talking about hope and cynicism and how Jesse's the cynic in the first film and Celine's the hopeful one. And Celine says it's important to her to love and to be loved, where Jesse says, I want to be remembered for something. Love's not as important to me right now. And then Celine tells the story about this 52-year-old man who never found love, never found a partner, and wound up just being alone. And at 52, 
He's full of regret because his life feels pointless and futile because he's alone. He has nobody to love. He has no one to grow old with. He has no one to take care of him when he gets old. And he has no one to spend his life with. And, you know, in your youth, I feel like you're just full of piss and vinegar. You're like, I don't need anybody. I'm, it's just me in the I'm world. I'm going to be young forever. I'll figure it out. <laughs> yeah. But then I think life hits some people at a certain age. And like, holy shit, I'm not going to be I'm going to be alone forever. Do I want to be alone forever or do I want to do something about it? And she talks about. You know, if magic is real, she finds that she believes that magic, if it's in if it's in the world, it's about it's in the attempt of understanding somebody and trying to love somebody and loving somebody. She says that's what she finds to be magic in reality. And what I love about both characters is Hawk and Delpy uh, put so much of themselves into the roles and into the writing. And so the writing process for the second and third film was Hawk, Delpy, and Linklater, they would spend the years apart, but they all three of them would take notes and come up with ideas and based on real life experiences. And then they would, the three of them, get together for a month and work out the screenplay and write it together in a room. And then they would film. That's how they wrote Before Sunset. That's how they wrote Before Midnight. But even still, in the first film, Delpy and Hawk both have stated that they did a lot of rewrites for the scenes and dialogue and they drew so much from their real life experiences. And that's why. I think that Jesse and Celine are the closest characters they played to Delpy and Hawk's real life personas. And if you watch Ethan Hawk interviews, he sounds like Jesse yeah. <laughs> a lot. Of, and same thing with Delpy. And so it's interesting to see how they put, you can see that they put their real life changes and transformations and made big events into the films. And I think the biggest example is Ethan Hawk and his marriage and divorce with Uma Thurman. It's clearly spoken about in Before Sunset. And Before Sunset, he's telling Jesse's telling Celine he's in like a loveless marriage. He, they got married because they got pregnant, um, but they're not right for each other, and he's unhappy. Good genes, though. Yeah, yeah my, great my, genes. My hawk got good genes. Great genes. And Ethan Hawke and Uma Thurman divorced a year after this film came out. So I think that Ethan Hawke, this is an example of Ethan Hawke putting his real life into the character of Jesse and but rewriting it in a different way where it's Jesse's wife he doesn't love anymore. They're just in a marriage and they feel more like roommates than anything. And I think it absolutely correlates to real life circumstances of Thurm Uma Thurman divorcing Ethan Hawke. I read a great quote. And also, I'm sorry, she divorced him for infidelity. True. And Jesse cheats on his wife with Celine. Yeah, and also Jesse, we find on Midnight, cheats on Celine yes. when he's on his book tour with that. That, that Emily from the bookstore. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I read a great quote from Delpy where she says the first script was great. What, what Rich, Richard and uh, what's her? Kim Richard, Crazer. Kim Crazer, what they came up with. Richard Linklater and Kim Crazer came up with the first script was great, but it didn't have the romance. And so Delpy and Hawk put so much of the romance into the first story, into the first script that wasn't really there because there's just a script about them walking around and talking, but like, where's the connection moments? Where, where's the, that, you know, that kiss on the top of the Ferris wheel, I'm sure was, yeah. had to do a lot with them as well. And I love how the characters physically transform in each film. They have completely different hair each film. Um, there are different body shapes each film. In the, in Before Sunset, they're both quite skinny. You can see it, like they're both very thin. In the first film, they're obviously very youthful. But also they the got hair. like that that youthful like chubby cheeks. Yeah, exactly. No wrinkles yet. Yeah. <laughs> and in the third film, they do look like they you know don't sleep as much. They're being worn down by life, having kids, and it's just a lot of stress going on. And you can feel that in the way they look. And Hawks going gray. Um, but I love how the hair changes. I love how their body changes. It, I love how Delpy. She's not afraid to you know, expose herself even though she's she calls herself for being overweight and she's not happy about it, but she's authentic enough to put that on screen, whereas obviously actresses and actors are always put on intense diets and training regimens, especially if they're going to be shirtless in a movie. But she cares more about, like, being truthful to how a woman really looks, so I thought that was just very admirable and before midnight. But the hairstyles, especially for Hawk, his character Jesse, they changed based upon what's in and, and what's fashionable in that era, for sure, and especially with Delpy's, but with Hawks, you, like that long hair was in, in the 90s, and then you get the short, spiky hair inspired by, obviously, Tyler Durden in Fight Club inspired that new look <laughs> in the hair world. And then in Before Midnight, it's 2011, 2012. 2013. 2013, sorry. 
that floppy hair was very in back then. I had the floppy hair at one point. And it was just like you kinda, had floppy hair last year. I did. Was yeah. it in? No, no, it was not in. <laughs> it was, I was just being lazy. So it's interesting to see, just like our friends and just like us, we change our looks. We change the kind of clothing we wear. We change the way our hair looks based upon what's trending, what's in. And Celine and Jesse do the same thing, and it's interesting to see how people grow and change over time. I'm sure we'll have different hairstyles in two years on this show than 2023 when this episode comes out. Yeah, and I'm sure Jesse, I mean, he hasn't really changed the way he dresses, but Celine definitely has. She's become much more stylish. She probably thought. I mean, I wouldn't say like she's more. She wears a dress in the first film. She wears a dress in the last film. It's, she a, wears, it's a nicer dress. In, I mean, I guess she's, she's a nicer dress in the third. She's film. Conf- maybe afford something a little yeah. more nicer, but she's got jeans and a blouse. In but the she film. she dresses nicely. She but, still dresses nice. She's yeah. wearing a dress in the first film. No, no, yeah, I know. I'm, that's what I'm saying. She dresses nice as she always has. She probably thought Jesse wearing a t-shirt and jeans was cute, but. By the third film, she's like, he's still dressed like a boy. Well, I married an American teenager. Yeah, he's yeah, still exactly. Teen, he's still an American teenager. So in a way, he hasn't changed. And even the other writer makes fun of him. He's like, when I first saw him, I couldn't believe that this person was a man yeah, of letters. The man, a man dressed like this was a man of letters, yeah. <laughs> and so she might have thought it was cute at first, but now she's sick of like the, the boyish uh, wardrobe that he wears. One of my favorite parts about this trilogy, obviously, is what this relationship have worked out if they exchanged information now the film ends in the around the second and third act they have that conversation where this is our only night together probably and they're like oh i mean what if we exchange information and then what i mean it's gonna fizzle out we write letters to each other it always fizzles out whenever you try to do something long distance or something like that where we're gonna fly to each other every year what's gonna happen i mean we saw it most recently with the movie past lives it's gonna fizzle out or celine gets the idea just this is tonight tonight's our only night let's just live it like that tonight's our only night together let's make the best of it let's make it incredible and it's really interesting and fascinating to to kind of have that awareness of what's the point of exchanging information if it's not going to work out let's just enjoy this evening and then we'll say goodbye to each other right now so we don't have to later on and then they get to the train station in the morning. Oh, my God, that was such a stupid idea. Well, we should have exchanged information. What do we do? Come up with the idea. Let's meet here in uh, five months. Month, five years. No, f- first Six they months. say oh, yeah. They say five years. Yeah. Celine says five years. Je- Jesse's like, what? no, this That's isn't a so social long. experiment. It's ridiculous. All right, one year. No, no, no. Six months. Six months from now. So it'll be December 16th. We'll meet here at this train stop. It'll be cold, but whatever. And... You could argue that fate occurred again to cause them not to meet because Celine's grandmother dies a few days before, so she can't make it to Austria. And obviously, we all find out that Jesse went to Vienna, even though he lies in the beginning of Before Sunset that he didn't go, but he really did eventually confessing to Celine that he did go to Vienna, put up flyers looking for her (laughs) and walked around for like a week and went home, which Celine felt terrible about eventually. You could argue that if they met up in Vienna six months after their first night together, that it would have fizzled out eventually. But because they don't see each other for nine years, what do they do? Jesse can't stop thinking about this night, even when he's married, even when he has a kid. He writes a book about this night together. He probably wouldn't have done that if they met up again. What's Celine do? She writes a beautiful song about this boy, about this night that she had with this boy. They both write because they're both thinking about each other for nine years, pining for each other. What could have been? What if we did meet at that train station? She's still thinking about it. He's still thinking about it. So if they met six months later in Vienna, you could argue, and I believe that they would have been in a long-distance relationship, and it would have fizzled out, and they would have never been together after that. I agree because the reason why they end up getting together is because the fantasy was still alive and before sunset. So because they never saw each other and because they never communicated long distance, that fantasy actually grew stronger than ever. And it became so powerful that they could never match that whenever they met someone new or tried to date someone new. They both had trouble ever comparing to that person. But because the fantasy of that person grew so strong, it was a detriment to them. Yeah, Celine says, like, I can't love anybody yeah, because of that one night. Exactly, and then Jesse said, obsessed over it so much that he wrote a book. He spent three years writing that book about her. And they just built that fantasy up and up and up. And then when they finally met again in Sunset, 
within an hour they hooked up because the fantasy was so strong. And so Jesse decided to blow his entire life up, ruin his marriage, and cheat on his wife. And affect his son. And affect his son because that fantasy was so strong that he made that impulsive decision, decided to miss his flight, and decided to spend the rest of his trip, who knows how many days, with Celine in her apartment. And the, the idea is like they spent like seven days making love that he wrote in the book. And did you really do that? He's did like, you really block out the windows? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe they did do that. And that ruined his, that, that blew up his life because the fantasy was so strong. But, and so since that strong pull of this idea of this person made the, Jesse make that decision, maybe it wasn't the right decision. And when they got pregnant, the first time they had sex without a condom, she got pregnant. You can imagine they didn't have sex that many times until she got pregnant. I mean, how long is Jesse going to be sleeping with her until she's like, at least he, it's, until she decides, okay, we can do it without a condom? Maybe a week or so, maybe a couple of weeks. So their courtship phase wasn't even that long. And so the fantasy affected their decision to get together in Sunset. They got pregnant very quickly. Then they're stuck with this in a way. And so in a way, I like to look at it, maybe they weren't fated because she did miss the second meetup. Maybe fate was saying we're not meant to be together. But because the fantasy was so strong, they just were so uh, alert to that, they impulsively hooked up, got pregnant, and then before midnight is basically the repercussions of that, of maybe they aren't supposed to be together, but they have a life now, and they have to make the best of it. Yeah, I mean, going back to time, they stole time. They created their own fate, you could say. Obviously, fate could be that they were supposed to meet, and they were supposed to get off the train, or maybe they weren't supposed to. Maybe they're, they've are they created their own new reality that shouldn't exist, and they're not actually meant to be together. But, I mean, that's life. That's life, And that's yeah. love. Are people meant to be together? Is that real? Is that true i'm i don't think so. i think it just depends on what you believe and if you believe in things happening for a reason if you believe in fate if you believe in determinism you know i i do prescribe to a good amount of that i think things do happen for a reason i won't say i completely believe in fate or that you're supposed to meet somebody but i think there's something to that i think there's something special about life something special about being a human and the experiences we have and the soul and the universe and being cosmic dust as the, the the who says that the um the the palm reader says that right you're, you're we're just cosmic yeah. dust you know I think that's really fascinating I think there's something to that connection that people have that we can have where it was it supposed to happen or meant to be I don't think anyone will ever know answers to those questions it can feel like that and maybe it is but I think that's what's special about love is no one really knows exactly what it is but according to Christopher Nolan it can transcend time and space. <laughs> I like I I don't believe in faded lovers and I don't believe in soulmates, but I do believe that around the world there are thousands of people that you can com- be so compatible with that it would be a fantastic relationship, and it's a matter of maybe finding someone one of those people and maybe you don't, and I, but that's what I believe. I believe that there isn't just one person for you. There are many options out there, but you do have to find one of those options. That it's just a a person that fits you so perfectly that it seems like it was destined. But what if life's just leading you to think that there's all these options, but really there's just this one person that's leading me. What if my... the life is a simulation? It could be. No one knows. <laughs> no one fucking knows. But I mean, there's so much to it, like the butterfly effect, but in terms of life, in terms of if I stay in that relationship for a month longer, if I didn't get in that relationship, I would have never never met this person. Or if I, you know, I'm 33 years old right now and like maybe if I live my life completely different, we wouldn't even be in Los Angeles. We wouldn't even be making a podcast episode right now. We wouldn't have a podcast. Maybe I'd be doing something completely different. Maybe I'd be a lawyer if I made different decisions in my past. But all the things and every decision in my life, pretty much every day of my entire existence had le- has led me to the point where I am today. Is that related to love? Is that related to the potential reality of do soulmates exist? But if there are so many options, how? what are the odds of ever finding your soulmate? Exactly. I'm not saying that soulmates exist. I'm just saying that something to life man there's some things that happen there's some magic things happen there's magic out there and i like how celine puts it where if magic is real it's the attempt of understanding somebody else yeah the mysteries of life but i do think that i don't think that celine and jesse are fated lovers but i do think that they are lovers who connected and by before midnight 
we're doing our best to make the best of what we got. No, yeah, I know. I, I agree with that too. Something else about this film that real I mean, these movies, the dialogue is so good and so real, even though it's so well scripted and detailed, no improvisation. What they come up with because, you know, they spend so much time writing on their own and for the last film, Delpy, Hawk, and Linklater kind of wrote their own scripts and so much, so many monologues that they would send Linklater via fax and everything for the last two movies, just coming up with ideas of things to talk about. The conversation is just feels so real. Like, you, it's a conversation you've had with anybody or with a lover or with a friend. And one of the ones that really hits home for me is when they're playing pinball in Vienna at that club they found find in like the middle of the night. And they're talking about breakups and Jesse finally confesses that he went to Spain to stay with his girlfriend who ended up breaking up with him. And so he's actually spent the last two weeks. He said he just found the cheapest flight out of Vienna and it was two weeks later. But really, he just didn't want to go home. He just wanted to be invisible and be a ghost for two weeks, just riding trains, eventually making his way to Vienna. I really like that. And I think that Celine was really drawn to that about him, that he just wanted to disappear and not kind of exist for anybody, be somewhere where no one knows him and he knows nobody, just like both of them in Vienna. Yeah, it's interesting to see they, actually, they lied to each other multiple times. And before sunset, when she asks, were you there at the train station? He goes, no, I, I didn't go. No, I mean, that's so like, who would do that? Like he was, and she, then she's like, wait, I would have gone. Why didn't why you didn't, go? Why didn't you? Then he's like, I did go. <laughs> and then she lied about the sex. And he's like, you don't remember we had sex? She's like, we didn't have sex. He's like, and she's like, did we have sex? I don't know. He, and she's like, you're, she's like, this is what I mean. You're idealizing it. You're, you're bringing too much fantasy. She's like, we didn't have sex. And he was like, he's like, I swear to God we had sex. And then she's like, we did have sex. I just didn't want to tell you. And we had sex twice, d tw dummy. Well, she's, she's like, women do that. We want to like, yeah. it's kind of like defensive. Exactly, in a way. yeah. And also when they're playing pinball, they're talking about breakups, right? And they're talking about how the worst, the worst thing about being broken up with, this is what something oh, that yeah, yeah. Jesse says. says, the worst thing about being broken up with is it reminds you of all the times you've broken up with people and how little you thought of them. And now that's how little they think of you. Yeah. And it makes you feel like shit. And I was like, fuck. <laughs> no, that's reality. That hit home. There are people you ignore, but then when someone ignores you, it's like, oh, fuck. I'm that person to no! them. No. It's, 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 it's real. It's reality, yeah. It's, that's what life is. But this movie does such a great job. There's, that's just an example of capturing great emotions and dialogue of things that we experience in our own lives. It's not bullshit. It's fucking authentic. This is reality. This is dating. This is life. This is love. This is romance. It's also, there's a connection, I think, in, so in that other bar where he asks the bartender for a bottle of wine without money, he's like, I'll pay you back. And he, he's like, okay, you'll, you'll pay me back. And then he gives him that free bottle of wine. He takes two glasses and they drink the wine in the park. I look at before midnight when they actually open that bottle of wine in the hotel room, pour two glasses, and neither of them even take a sip. They both hold the glasses, but then the fight continues and they can't even drink the wine with each other. It's a great point because... When you watch these movies back to back to back and then actually finish the trilogy, then watch Before Sunrise again, because there's so many things you pick up on that are obviously they're in the first film. And they I think they just took like, how can we connect this to the last film? How can we do this? And maybe my favorite one is when Jesse tries to convince Celine to get off the train. So he goes up to her. She's like, oh, my God, this is your stop. They just had a great lunch in the in the dining compartment. And they, they're really connecting. He says, oh, man, I wish I met you sooner. Like, I really enjoy talking to you. And she says, yeah, I, I, I like that, too. And he goes and gets his bag, comes back to Celine, and he's like, all right, I have a crazy idea. And he's asking her, like, oh, I feel like there's a connection here. And she says she feels that, too. And she's wary to get off and hesitant to get off the train with him. And then he says, all right, here. Jump 10, 20 years ahead <laughs> in the future, right? He's time traveling. Your future husband, you, you don't have that energy you used to have. You're not happy. And you think of all the times these guys you met that you could have you could have done something with. I'm one of those guys. But really, Jesse becomes the husband yeah. that their relationship doesn't have the energy with anymore. It's so fascinating. And then what's he do at the end of Before Midnight? Goes back to time traveling. He goes to the future again to communicate with 80-year-old Celine. Brought back this letter that she wrote. So it's really interesting that they use this great sequence of convincing her to get off the train about time traveling, bring it back before midnight. Even though they've become this, he, he's become that future husband. Their relationship doesn't have the energy it used to have. 
does time traveling again to try to convince her to, in a way, metaphorically, get off the train again. Hawk actually wrote that because, like I said about them helping add to that screenplay, even though they aren't credited, she wasn't convinced that she would get off the train for the original Jesse's dialogue. And then so Ethan Hawk kept coming up with different ways to try and get Julie Delpy to say, yes, I would get off the train for that. So when he came up with that time travel scenario, jumping in the future, she's like, I'd get off the train for that guy. And then she's like, I, I knew I was going to sleep with you when I got off that train. Yeah. <laughs> she's like, I made that decision, I think, when I got off the train. <laughs> but also, I, speaking of that, I think that Jesse made the decision to cheat on his wife the moment he saw Selena in the bookstore. I think he made, because that entire conversation, and what I love about Before Sunset, it is the real-time epi- the real time version of the films. What happens in the film happens in real time. He's got like an hour and a half. Yeah, and literally that movie is 80 minutes. So we have the bookstore, and then to her apartment. It doesn't cut to any scenes. It's just they're traveling and talking without fast-forwarding whatsoever. I think that's the strength of the film. But I think that Jesse made the decision, oh, I'm going to try to sleep with her today to make that final step that they haven't gotten and to be like, this. let's solidify this relationship. And so I think he made that decision, just like how Celine made the decision, like, I, I'm going to sleep with this guy when she got off the train. I think he was like, I'm, we need to sleep together today. And then in the entire conversation of Before Sunset, she keeps saying, hey, you're going to be late, you're going to be late, you're going to be late. And he keeps brushing it off because he already d- made his decision. He's, he, he decided, I'm not getting on that plane today. I'm not going on that plane today. That's where he decided when he saw her yeah. at, the, at the bookstore. I'm That's what it is. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. He decided, I'm not, no, I'm going to sleep with him. I'm, just, yeah. I'm not getting that plane. I'm not getting on that plane. And so he kept extending this walk. He kept extending this conversation. And she's the one who kept being worried about his flight and missing his flight. And he was like, I, I already made that decision when I saw you. Sing me a song. It's a great song, too. She's got a beautiful voice. Delphi wrote that song. Yeah, it, it's really beautiful. Yeah. And also, they put on a Nina and a Simone album in her apartment. And in Before Midnight, we learned that one of their daughters is named Nina. And then the other daughter is named Ella after Ella Fitzgerald. Oh, that's very cool. Yeah, very they cute. talk about Ella Fitzgerald in the first one. I really love in Before Sunrise the, the listening booth scene at the record store. Oh, yeah. It's really special. And it's relatable. You know, you barely know this person. And then you're just like wandering Vienna and you're in this record store. You're not going to buy any records, but you find one to listen to. And you're in that listening booth together. And they're both just playing that game of looking at each other, but not getting caught looking at them. And they're both like looking away. You know, he's just them. trying to muster the courage up to kiss her. Yeah, and exactly. she wants him to. Yeah, or at least just look at each other to to like make that connection because they just got off the train. They're both probably insanely nervous and being very diffident and shy. And it's, I think it's a really special scene. It's one of my favorite in the entire trilogy. I love the phone call scene in the restaurant. Oh, at the, at at the, the booth? booth? Yeah. yeah, I love that scene. I think that's great. Because that's a confession. Yeah. You know, they're making their confession. They're being about... honest by telling someone in an in a yeah. imaginary scenario, yeah. telling their feelings. She does it first where she says, like, I, I think I fell for him, like, at this moment. Like, I, I, fe- I fell for this guy already. And then he says, like, I'm crazy about her. But they're they're both confessing. What they're feeling, like you said, like perfectly, not to themselves technically, but looking at them, but pretending there's somebody else so they are not afraid to do it. And in a way, it's possible that if they lived in the same city and met in the city, it might not have had the same magic. Yeah. It, I don't think it could have, it would have had the same magic as if they met in a foreign country and had an amazing night together. I don't think it would have worked if they just went and met and went on a date normally, and they lived in the same area. Oh, I absolutely agree. I don't think it would have had that same pull. They would have just had, like, a relationship, and maybe it would have survived, maybe it wouldn't have. Yeah. Maybe they'd be happier, who knows? Because I think the fantasy of that night became so strong in their minds that it was a height and a peak that they would never have reached with anyone else, even though it wasn't real. There's two things that I really... There's there's one thing I love in addition about Before Midnight, and one thing I'm not a huge fan of bef- with Before Midnight. Before Midnight's the only film in the trilogy with its own original score. It's really terrific. Yes. It's beautiful. However, Before Midnight is also the only film that was shot digitally. I don't, I don't like the digital camera. It's an early days great. digital. Yeah, it's it's an early Ari. I mean, no, Red or Ari, Ari. Ari Alexa. And it's just very sharp. And it Too clean. Do- it doesn't have the same quality as the first two films. Especially because Sunset, they added like that um, hazy uh, quality to the highlights, yeah. the dreamy quality. And then to go from that to very sharp. I understand why Linklater does it. It makes because they do so many long takes. It's just so much easier with digital cameras to do long takes. Um, but I also 
the cinematography in Before Midnight is my least favorite part. But I will say, I've seen these films many times over the years. I've always had Before Sunrise as my favorite. But after watching them all back to back to back in one evening, I found Before Midnight to be my new favorite. Why? First of all, it's the funniest. It's very funny. But also, I just think that I'm at an age where I understand the realities of life, and I think they did a wonderful job of capturing, like, a true relationship. Um, and I love, ro I love the romance of the first film and the magical quality to it, but uh, there's something about the third film where I feel like it hits home the best. It has the best conflict. It is the one with conflict. I mean, the conflicts in the first two films are the same thing. We have a finite amount of time together right now. Well, the conflict in the second one is also that he's married. Yeah, and that too. Yeah, he has yeah. a kid. And but it's not, but not really like a big conflict. But in the in Midnight, there are multiple conflicts. It feels more true to life. Um, and I think the performances are really fantastic. And I think that it takes away the fantasies of the first film in that the, the magic of the first films and, places, and replaces it with realities of life. And I find it to be the most relatable of the films. And I just I think that the, the, the dialogue is its best in Midnight. I think it's absolutely stunning because they do talk a little bit too much about very big themes in the first couple of films. Like because they're young. They're read they're learning stuff in college and they're talking about the things they're learning. But in Midnight, it's very much what they're talking about is more so very relatable and more, I think, real life, true to life kind of conversations. And I think that for me, I found it to just be the one I now connect to the most. Yeah, it really hit me. I, I don't know if it's because I'm at an older age now, even though we're probably the age that they'd be in before sunset. Yeah, than anything. we're actually older. Yeah, like slightly older. <laughs> well, because he's 41. 32. He's 41 in before midnight. Uh -huh. And so that means that he would be uh, 32 in before yeah. sunset. They're both 32 so, Yeah, we're about the same age as yeah. in 32 sunset. No, she's younger than him. Oh, yeah, yeah. Remember, right, she says, right, you're right, the yeah. oldest guy I've ever yeah. fucked. Yeah. And well, no, she says that in midnight because he is in midnight, the oldest. Yeah, but she's in her 30s still. No, but no, but they're I believe they're the same age. I believe they're both thirty-two in sunset and both forty-two in midnight. Yeah, they're probably pretty close. But when she says you're the oldest guy I fucked, it's because he's forty-two. Yeah, forty-one, now. forty-one now. Yeah, good point. All right, um, I think that before midnight is also the best screenplay. It's so well written. It's really well made. It, it really is, and the acting is excellent. They're both so talented, obviously, even in the first one, but. In terms of their skill craft of what they've created throughout their careers, they're they're sensational in the last movie. They really are incredible performances. But before sunrise is still my favorite. You know, it's just so special to me. And my favorite romance film. It's so magical, and I love that quality to it. Even though you know that concept of is true real is true love real? Does it exist? I, I think it's so fascinating. It's such a beautiful movie. Ironically, Sunset is the highest rated, according to who? IMDb. On IMDb, let me double check yeah, that. So I believe on Letterboxd too. On no, Before Sunrise and Before Sunset are both an eight point one on IMDb, and then Before Midnight's a seven point nine. Ron Tomatoes Before Sunrise is one hundred percent critic score, ninety three percent audience score. Before Sunset is ninety four percent critic score, ninety two percent audience score, and then Before Midnight is ninety eight percent critic score, eighty two percent audience score. So I think that it's clear that Before Sunrise is the most loved, but Before Midnight. 98% is excellent, but 100% on Rotten Tomatoes. That's a masterpiece, baby. All three are. Oh, yeah, they all are. You're right. Sunrise is up higher on IMDb than Sunset. I don't know where I thought I saw that Sunset had a higher rating. Maybe Letterboxd or Metacritic or something like that. It is Letterboxd. Hold up. I got it right here. Yeah, I think Before Sunset's number one on Letterboxd. Because Before Sunset was on was higher up a little bit in the top 100 when we did that episode. Before Sunset like seven is a 4.4 on... Letterbox and then before sunrise is a four point three. Yeah, yeah. Sunset is higher regarded. Sunset's like a four point three five, rounded yes, up. Yeah, right. Yeah, slightly, slightly better. But I, I'm, I might, if I was gonna rank them, it would be three one two. Mine would be one three two. I mean, when midnight, midnight is. I think what really sets it apart is they're revealing so intensely their deepest issues within them completely unfolded in front of the other person 
That doesn't quite happen in the other two movies. And I also feel like if I ever get married or I'm, I ever have a, a life partner, it would really hit home. It yeah. would really hit me even harder, even if I don't know if I ever had a kid or, or kids. Then that movie would really connect to you. Then it might be your favorite after yeah, that. Yeah, then not necessarily my favorite, maybe too real. Maybe too <laughs> reminiscent. Who knows? I mean, I'm not saying that I'm, we don't know what's going to happen in life, but I, I still love the fairy tale of, of Before Sunrise. I really do. I mean, yeah, it's amazing. These, all three are amazing. They're all 10 out of 10s for me, man. 10 out of 10s. Perfect, perfect, There's no, perfect. There, there are no other movies like them. They're, so un- they're different, too, which is what's great about them. Linklater is a special filmmaker. He really is. He's excellent. I mean, very few stories or, or pieces of media you get to see characters who have aged over 20 years on screen. It's really fascinating to see. He's doing a new one right now. Yeah, with uh, um, Paul Meskel is going to be in it. I believe it's going to be 20 years or something. Yeah, really long time. Because Boyhood was over the course ten. of that 10 years. Mm-hmm. And, but 20 years of three ca- of these two characters... Really fascinating. I think they're going to do a fourth one, but not anytime soon. So they tried to get it going to get it in time for 2022. But when the three of them got together, they couldn't figure out an idea that was good enough to meet the quality of the other three films. They didn't want to do one if it wasn't going to be as good. And if you think about it, what what could they do? The kids are teenagers now. They're still having the same problems. I don't think that their lives will have changed so much. But I think... If they wait maybe 30 years, they do it when they're very old. I think the mo- there's a movie there about aging. Yeah, call, I guess call uh, it before uh, dusk or something, before dawn. Before dawn or before dusk. I guess now if they did it recently, if they would do one soon, it would be maybe they have been de- they've separated and they have other spouses or something like that. Who knows? And then they maybe I mean, do you want to see that? Not really. Exactly. I'm I just think, trying to think yeah. of well, yeah, what would they do? I think the best approach would be to wait until they're both elderly and to do something like a more Maybe, yeah, it's a good maybe idea. Maybe less tragic, but that's I think idea. that's a, like that's when their lives will have changed a lot because from sun sunrise to sunset, their lives changed a lot, and then from sunset to midnight, their lives changed a lot. But if you do it from just ten years from now, their lives aren't going to be that much different. It's just they'll still have the family dynamic, same issues. It's just the kids will be a little bit older. But if they do it in twenty, thirty years, there will be grandparents, and they'll be maybe retired, and they're struggling with aging. There can be lots of room for high quality storytelling if they wait that long. Yeah, because I think that I think that Celine and Jesse have enough of their relationship still intact and enough potential of that fire to be rekindled that they can rekindle what they once had and life will get easier as the kids grow up. Relationships aren't easy there hard work you may not love each other the same amount every day or the same that you used to but that's love and i think that you can get back to that point that you once had that love when you were young i think i think they're going to survive i think their relationship's going to make it i think they'll stay together till they pass away that's how i look at jesse and celine maybe that's what you do then one of them passes away yeah like a more oh man what a what a trilogy it's great i love it i love it and it was amazing to, i've never watched them all three in a row in a night and it was a great night I watched them in. I watched Before Sunrise like two months ago, just out of the blue because I love it. And then I watched Before Sunset like two weeks ago. And you were like, "Hey, let's just do an episode." Yeah, I heard, I heard, I heard, I heard Celine it. and Jesse in your room. Yeah. And then uh, I watched Before Midnight uh, like five days ago. But then I watched Before Sunrise again the other night just to like refresh my memory. And then Harry Potter movies in between. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a fun couple of weeks of movies. But it was so cool that I watched all three. Then I went back to Before Sunrise to see all the and you see all these little things that you see in Before Midnight. It's really fascinating. But yeah, that wraps our episode on the Before Trilogy. Man, what a great Finally trilogy. covering it. Thank you so much for tuning in. Again, the best way to support our show and to help us grow is to share us with your friends and family members. It's the best way for a podcast to get bigger numbers and get discovered. In addition to that, you know, become a patron at patreon.com slash Raiders of the Lost Podcast and leaving those five-star ratings and reviews on Spotify and Apple, Podca- Apple, <laughs> Apple Podcasts are insanely beneficial. Thank you so much for tuning in. See you next time. This episode was executive produced by our chosen one patrons, Cody Moen, Andrew Hagen, Becca Keen, Benjamin Cook, Calvin Murphy Griggs, Nicholas Martin, Darian Singleton, Tyler McFly, Andrew Hagen. Our chosen one patrons are our biggest supporters. Thank you so much. Raiders of the Lost podcast is a Mirror Image production. 
Sound mixing done by Jacob Kosler. Opening music by Chase Jackson.